Several churches were having problems with squirrels damaging their buildings. All the trustees are paying attention now. The Presbyterian Church called a meeting to decide what to do about their squirrel infestation. And after much prayer and consideration, they concluded that the squirrels were predestined to be there and they should not interfere with God's divine will. At the Baptist Church, the deacons met and decided to put a water slide on the baptistry and let the squirrels drown themselves. The squirrels liked the slide and all, unfortunately knew instinctively how to swim, so twice as many squirrels showed up the following week and soon ended up destroying the church. But the Catholic Church came up with a more creative strategy. They baptized all the squirrels and made them members of the church. Now the squirrels are only seen at Christmas and Easter. <laughs> Not much was heard from the Jewish synagogue. They took the first squirrel and circumcised him. They haven't seen a squirrel since. <laughs> My wife said I shouldn't have shared that joke, but I thought it amusing. Anyway, we're going to talk about being a church member. I'll try not to be too squirrely. Um, certainly, every uh, every church needs help in in this whole idea of how do we how do we operate as a church and, and as members of that church, pastors included, and. Uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to belong to the church. You have a wonderful opportunity because you belong to a great church. So it is a blessing to be a part of what we are uh, joined together about. As we discovered last time, Jesus Christ shed his very blood that we should be part of the church, his body. Uh, we talked about the fact that the church is is glorious, right? It is his body. It is, it is purchased by him. And, it, and we are part of that, and so it is a, is a wonderful thing. The church is, in fact, the very agency that God uses to declare the gospel to a lost world. And so rather than being an optional, insignificant thing that we, we may choose to add to our lives, we, it's actually something that is a great privilege to be a part of. So, in what ways would you say is the church glorious? We talked about it last week, but in, in what ways would you say the church is a glorious thing? Yeah, Brad. You've got other people to lean on in your time of need. Okay. That is a glorious thing. I agree with that. Uh, any other thoughts? It's where we praise God together. Okay. So we're praising God. That's a, that's a, and, and in fact, it's a God glorifying <clears throat> thing. And yeah, absolutely. We do that together. Absolutely. Yeah. How about, um, Here's a question. What is the universal church? We talked about that last week as well. What's, what do I mean by universal church? I don't mean that we worship the universe. So, go ahead. All believers. Yeah. All believers of, um, of Jesus, of God. And, and the cool thing about that is not just of every, every race, every nation, every people of every tribe, of every era, right? All believers, believers 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years, all believers in the whole universal church. There's a whole, there's a whole part of the church we've never seen. In fact, by far the, the majority of the church we've never seen, right? Uh, but there's a majority of the church that's in heaven now that, we've, that we will see one day. And, and we'll get to know maybe some of our heroes, which would be kind of cool. Um, how about the local church? How would you describe the local church? Universal church is everybody. What's the local church? The one you go to. Yeah, there you go. The jackpot. The one you go to. Yeah. The one right here. Um, absolutely. This is the local church. This is where, and so it's kind of like, it's one thing to say I belong to the universal church, right? I belong to the group of all believers everywhere. That's cool. And we do that by placing our faith in Christ. But where people would know that I really am part of the universal church is how they see it lived out in the local church, right? And so this is where we kind of kind of live it out. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, this idea of being part of a local church, and we're going to talk about what a local church looks like. We're going to look at three things. Maybe we'll get to all three today. We'll see. A living, the church is a living church 
church. It is a growing church, and it is a God-glorifying church. Those are three elements, three aspects of a local church that ought to exist. Now, if you're thinking of becoming a member of our church, that's also a good idea. Please let me know. Shameless plug advertisement right here for church membership. If you're hearing these sermons on belonging to a local church, you say, hmm, I really should join this church. I agree, you should. Uh, talk to me after we can, we can talk about that. But I want to begin and, and talk about this idea of a living church. Let's go ahead and look at a uh, passage of Scripture, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It says that he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I want to just alert you of something that you may not have known before, but I am not a biologist. Okay? just want to state that clearly. Uh, biology was actually one of my courses that I took in high school that I hated the most and did terribly in. Uh, but we're going to talk about church biology for a moment or two, because the church is described here in Ephesians as the body of Christ. And this is not, this is not the only place, obviously, that, that describes the church as a body with Christ as the head over it. In fact, it's all throughout the New Testament. Many people think of the church as an organization, right? And they think of the, so if you just think of the church as a physical place, and it has members and it votes and things. We, we think of the church oftentimes as an organization. But if we look at Ephesians 1, we don't really hear Paul describing an organization, do we? Um, it actually looks more like an organism. In fact, what would you say would be the difference between the two? If we're thinking about ways to describe the church, is it an organization or is it an organism? What is the difference? Any thoughts? An organism is alive. There you go. Yes. It's living. Organization, uh, is, it, is it alive? It's, what's that? Has structure. Has structure. Yes, it does. Um, uh, it has structure, and that's not a bad thing, and it certainly... We, we have many organizations, some that we're a part of, right? How many of you have a job or had a job, right? You probably were working for some sort of an organization. If you were self-employed, you, you kind of created your own organization, right? With you as the CEO and also the bottle washer and everything else, right? Um, organizations are not bad, but they're not alive. And... So for the church, we need to understand that the church is actually a living thing. And there are things about things that are alive that are important. Uh, this great quote here by Clarence Larkin, he says, The fact that the church is a body made up of living members shows that it is an, not an organization, but an organism. An organization is made up of distinct units, like the doors, windows, roof, floors, etc., of a building that may be removed and replaced by new parts without destroying the integrity of the building. But a human body is an organism. You cannot remove an eye or an ear or arm or foot or even a fingernail or tooth without destroying the integrity of the body and causing a mutilation. So we see from this, for Christ to lose one member of his body, the church, is to mutilate it. Interesting thought, isn't it? Kind of, it's kind of making it in kind of an extreme way, but if you're looking at the church as an organization, what will happen? You say, oh, we lost members. We need more members because we need a certain amount of members to give a certain amount of money so we can pay a certain amount of bills and, and, and all of those things. If it's all structured on um, the building itself, how much money comes in, how many people there are there, we lose the sense of it's an organism, and Ron doesn't have value because Ron gives money to the church or he fixes stuff or he's a trustee. He has value because he's part of the body of Christ. He is an essential part of the body. If we didn't have Ron, we'd have something drastically missing. It's true. 
I like to bust on Ron, but I like Ron. And I like Ron being here. And I find him to have great value as part of this body because he belongs to Christ and we belong to one another. And when we think about our own bodies, I'm thinking about my body right now. In fact, one little thing is off in my vision in my left eye. I'm seeing shadow and I don't like it and it's concerning me. Well, you think about that. When, when there's a part of the body of Christ that has something just a little off, it's a big deal. Why? Not because of an organizational issue, but because we are an organism, we are a living thing together. And when one part, that's what Paul says, right? When one part suffers, we all suffer. We're concerned because we care about each other. We need each other. Each part's important. There's not a person in here that's not an important part of the whole. You see that? This idea of being a, a living thing is, is a wonderful thing. Again, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> but I know that when we lose organs, when we lose body parts, something happens to the integrity of the body. Um, Bill mentioned today a friend is struggling with needing a kidney. We got a guy in Troy Baptist Church, and he's waiting, been waiting and waiting for a kidney. And his body doesn't function properly without a proper kidney. And so adjustments have to be made, right? We, we kind of we kind of do that. We say, well, we have body parts of the body that are struggling a bit, and so we we do what a body does, right? The body is such an incredible thing that God created, and one the one part of it is 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 down. Kind of there's there's a whole lot of stuff that happens to to, to adapt to that. We do the same. We realize somebody's struggling, and so we we adapt within this body, and we say, "How do we help? How do we how do we lift that person up? They're 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 lacking, they're hurting, they're struggling. How do we come alongside and help?" Colossians 2, 18 and 19 says, let no one disqualify you as insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast, here we go, to the head, now let's talk about Christ, the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Isn't that interesting? That's talking about uh, joints and ligaments, things that people who know stuff about um, the human body understand, and I don't. Renee, you probably have some understanding of some of this stuff, right? <laughs> these, these things that, that knit us together. And, and I love it how we're to hold fast to the head, that is Christ, the head of the body, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Not only do we see that the church grows, but the growth comes from God. It's interesting how God, it's, his, it's, it's Christ's body, and he nourishes it, and he helps it to grow, which leads us to our second point. Can you believe we're coming to our second point already? The church is a growing church. Now I gotta ask you a question. What do you call something that is not growing? Huh? Dead. Yeah, not living, passed on. Um, what do you call a church that is not growing? It's the same answer, right? And uh, there are churches that, that kind of kind of miss this point. If a church says, "I don't need to grow," I kind of like the way we got it right now. That church is that church is dying. I can tell you that. I, I want to talk about growth here in, in two contexts. First of all, there should be growth numerically, but there should also be growth primarily spiritually. But let's, let's talk about numerical growth. Why do you think that some churches do not grow in numbers as fast as others? You ever seen some of these churches? They, they've been around for, for three months. They've got 900 people. Like, how did that happen? Right? Why is it that some churches grow faster than others? And, and we're not going to have an exhaustive list, but just, just curious, of, curious about your, your thoughts, your ideas. Why do you think some churches don't grow numerically as much as others? They invite people. 
What's that? They invite people. Okay, I'm actually taking it from the negative, so I'm, I'm going to take your answer from, so we'll say they don't invite people, don't right? Invite. Churches aren't growing as, as well as others. They're not inviting people, right? Yeah, it's a great answer. Absolutely. Give me another one. Leadership. Leadership. Okay, yeah. Could be bad leadership. You could have uh, bad decisions being made um, by, by the leadership of the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please don't say the pastor. Um, <laughs> How about another reason why churches don't grow? We don't have a flashy band. Don't have a flashy band. <laughs> okay. What you say? They don't. People don't feel welcome. People don't feel welcome. Yeah, it's a great answer. It's a great answer. No one else. These are, and again, I, I, these aren't. Uh, we're not going to have an exhaustive list. You probably will go home. Oh yeah, here's another reason. You know. Uh, there are any number of reasons why churches don't grow. I've got a few here that I just wanted to bring up. Sometimes people don't want to grow. Again, if your understanding of your church wanders into an aspect of organization instead of organism, you might say, well, we're meeting our budget. We're... Uh, we have enough money to keep the, the building up, whatever, and, and we have the, the programs and things that we like and people are coming. We, we have all the stuff we think we want and we're good. And so it, it, it kind of, then the, then the church kind of turns in inward and just says, we'll just deal with the stuff we got here. We're good to go. The only problem is eventually people start to die off and, and then eventually, if that if that track continues, then you have nobody left, right? Um, but there are some that, quite frankly, don't want to grow. I've always said it's kind of funny. A church will say, and this, this, if you want to talk to a bunch of pastors, you will all agree with this. A church will say, you know, we really need to change. We really need to change. And then they'll say, the next pastor we get, we're going to get a pastor who will help us to change. And so they... They go through a slew of, of resumes and they hire a guy. This guy's going to help us change. And so the whole congregation says, do we want to vote and bring this guy in to help us see change? And they say, oh, absolutely. Unanimous vote. They bring him in to bring change. And then he changes one thing. And they say, hey, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> um, we we kind of like sometimes what we have. The church is not growing spiritually could be a reason that the, that the church is dying. If they're not growing spiritually then we start having all kinds of problems, right? Because if we're not growing spiritually, we're allowing certain sinful behaviors to just can go on and not be checked. We don't care about how the, how the way that we live our lives. We don't care about the holiness of God. We don't care about loving one another. While a church that doesn't love one another is, is doomed to not last very long. Uh, this one might speak to Claude's uh, answer. They have no clear direction. If you have bad leadership, you're probably not going anywhere. No clear direction. Um, having no, That would speak to the idea of vision. Do we have an idea of what we believe, and then based on what we believe, what we value, what do we want to do? How do we want to impact our community? How do we want to grow the church? How do we want to put things in place that people would want to come and be a part of? They're not kind to newcomers. I, I think that was mentioned, not, not welcoming, right? Somebody comes in here and they feel like they've an annoyed your group by showing up to it. <laughs> they won't come back, right? Uh, have you ever walked into a church and you felt like, oh, I don't think they want me here, ever? I, I've been in churches that didn't seem too friendly. Um, that's one way a church can not grow because if, if the... Um, People that come to it feel like they have no place. Not only, not only do people need to feel like they're welcome to come, but once they get here, uh, is there an opportunity for them to get involved, right? Is there a choir they can join, right? They can come and sing. Is there, uh, can they lead worship? Can they, 
can they help out on a, on a, a work team project, right? Where we're helping out the trustees, we're cleaning up the grounds. But people want to be involved. People that come to a church, they want to serve, they want to give, they want to contribute, they want to be a part. So are, are you putting stuff out there that would invite people to do those kinds of things? <clears throat> We could, we could mention more. The bottom line is this. It's the kind of thing, if we're going to be a good church member, we need to think about those kinds of questions. Hey, how are we doing this whole church thing? And how can we do it better? What are some ways that people could feel more welcome? What are some ways people could be more easily and quickly integrated into, into serving and being a part and feel like they're, they're able to do that? I'm just throwing those out there as kinds of things that every church has to look at on a regular basis, right? How, how are we doing with this? Um, no, no church has perfectly figured it out, so there's always room for thinking about those things. Matthew chapter 16 is going to give us some encouragement here. Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This rock here means this, this confession that Peter made that Jesus is the Christ. That, that confession of Christ is what we build the whole church on, right? And what I love here is that it says that it is Jesus himself who builds the church. And I, I can tell you that as a pastor, I have spent a lot of time beating myself up over, uh, particularly when we, had, we planted a church in, in Massachusetts, we started from nothing and we would say, why are more people not coming? What am I doing wrong? I must be doing everything wrong. We're not as big as you know this church and that church. And, who builds the church? Christ builds the church. We don't build the church. Now we can we can do our part again in, in being a loving body together, growing, spiritually maturing, working on we can do all and we need to do that. But at the end of the day, you don't build the church. And I don't build the church. I think some churches think. Well, it's been five years. The church hasn't grown to this many number. We better fire the pastor because we don't have enough uh, people. Well, who builds the church anyway? Does the pastor build the church? No. Now, the pastor could undermine it and, and destroy a church. I agree with that. Um, I think we have power to bring destruction to a church, but I, we don't have the power to build a church. Jesus does that. And to me, there's great encouragement in that. This is his church. Um, there's ownership here, right? Christ is the head of the church. Christ includes us as his body, but it's his church. He purchased it with his blood, and he builds it. And boy, that takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it, a little bit? That's his department. He grows the church. However, then when you see somebody walk in, what a privilege to say, wow, if Christ is building the church, and he's sending this person to be a part of it, I certainly better be loving and invite them to be a part of that body. I'm going to talk about this aspect of spiritual growth, and I'm getting a sense from the clock that we're going to end at the end of point two here instead of three. Um, the church not only grows numerically, but it grows spiritually. Ephesians 4, 28 Interesting verse, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Notice how this describes in a church setting that you have some, well, they were a thief. Okay, they need to stop stealing, labor, do honest work, and share. J. Carrot Gell writes, when a thief gets saved, he stops stealing. <clears throat> One surely would hope. But he doesn't just stop stealing, he gets a job. But he doesn't just get a job to stockpile for himself. He works so he can share with others who might have needs. That is real transformation. Christians gather as a church to develop relationships. Former sinners who, who, used, who used people have been transformed into servants who love others. 
And this community is characterized by the kind of love Jesus showed us. Our whole life is part of the church. We should be growing. The church is always a growing church. Let me ask you this, and we're going to close with this uh, due to time. In what ways have you grown spiritually because you belong to a church? What would you say? How, how have you grown spiritually because you belong to, and you could say, as a result of belonging to East Troy Baptist, how have you grown spiritually because you belonged to a church? Bible Make you a stronger believer. Make you a stronger believer. Great. Uh, Bill? Bible programs that the church has had over the years. Bible programs that the church has had. Excellent. Judy? I was going to say that. Same Bible, thing? Bible understanding. Bible understanding? Sure. Excellent. Anyone else? You're, you're, you're making a shameless plug for the Sunday and or whatever day it turns out to be school that we're going to do here. Uh, uh, yeah, more Bible instruction, right? But um, the, the fellowship. You know. Fellowship, yes. Uh, tell me how fellowship helps you to grow spiritually. Because I agree with you wholeheartedly, but just flesh it out a little bit. Well, you know, people are there to support you when you need help, and you're there to support them, and, yeah. and, and you're doing it understanding that God's in control of this, you know. Yeah, and, and you're not alone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so many people, they, they attempt to live the Christian walk by themselves. Boy, that's a really frustrating uh, effort, isn't it? How much better to have people alongside you helping you along the way, right? When, when you're down and hurting, someone can be there with, with a, a word of prayer and, and maybe even physically doing something that you have a need of. Uh, the Good Samaritan Fund is a great example of that, right? The, the deacons have a Good Samaritan Fund. Sometimes somebody needs, uh, financially needs help. And they have a spiritual need, but they also have a physical need. And that's able to be met. What a blessing. Um, I think there are so many ways that we grow spiritually that happens in the church context that just can't happen at home. Uh, I look forward to church. Uh, I look forward to coming and being with you. I look forward to the, to, you know, you come to church, you get to get a, a hug from Henry. Uh, you don't get a Henry hug sitting at home, right? There are certain things that happen in a church setting that can only happen when the church comes together. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. The beautiful thing about this church is we're a group of people that praise the Lord a group that prays for each other and a group that is there for you if you need any help. That's what makes this church what it is. Yeah. And you preach from the word. We sing from the word, those old hymns. And it's just like God is right here. That's what I love about this church. Awesome. And the people, we communicate with each other. And I can't get around as fast as meet everybody but anymore, but Thing just let them come to you, that's all. <laughs> but it's just a nice feeling to know. I miss church when I'm not here, but when I'm here, I enjoy it. I really do, and I give God the glory for it all. Amen. And I think about it, we close with this thought. Can you imagine? Now, you've experienced growing in your understanding of the Word, you've experienced the joy of, of relationship, fellowship with one another, the joy that, that you have, the sense of God's presence. Can you imagine being in heaven with all of God's people around the throne? Absolutely. I, I mean, you're just getting a small taste here. A small, small, small taste when you think of what we're heading for. What a blessing that will be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. And thank you for the fact that you have brought the church into existence. Lord, it is, it is something that you purchased with your blood. We are connected. Our, our joints and sinews all connected to you as the head. Uh, Lord, help us to, to walk out the way our lives, the way that you want us to live. Help the church to be that, that body of, of believers who love each other so much and care for one another's needs and, and honor and glorify you. Thank you for the privilege to belong to your church and, and thank you for your spirit that enables us and, and helps us 
to be the church that you've called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.